think it's uh, so important uh, the way that you support fundamental science. So um, today I'm going to tell you um, about, yes, work in my, uh, my group um, and work that I've been a part of um, to understand uh, mechanisms of regeneration. And um, it is a particular honor as well to receive this award uh, recognizing um, uh, Elizabeth Hay, um, whose um, fundamental discoveries in the ECM have um, done quite a lot to inform uh, the way that we think about um, signaling in development. And here she is, um, at, she had a lifelong um, passion uh, for discovery. Here she is at her electron microscope. And then actually um, digging into this, she, uh, she did some very important work uh, on planaria uh, um, uh, stem cells using electron uh, microscopy, and I'll, I'll get to this, uh, mention this again in a minute. So um, I don't I probably need to elaborate to this audience um, that there are many cases uh, throughout nature uh, of animals that have uh, the ability to regenerate missing parts. Um, and th this ability is found in uh, most phyla to varying degrees. And so um, uh, our, our perspective is that these animals, in a sense, have sort of discovered um, aspects of biology that we'd be very interested in having uh, for humans someday, um, the ability to, to grow back um, missing or damaged parts. And on a fundamental level, uh, this problem has um, fascinated observers for centuries. Um, so yes, we've turned to um, try and the kind of the, the grand tradition of selecting a model system that highly exaggerates the phenomena that you're interested in. Uh, I became interested in, in planaria regeneration uh, in, when I did a postdoc with Peter Redeem. Uh, and so we're very interested in understanding uh, how it is that these animals have these remarkable abilities. Planarians can regenerate uh, after almost any kind of, of entry, uh, decapitation, uh, removal of the tail, even a very small tissue fragment uh, has all the progenitors and all the information it needs uh, to grow back its body. <clears throat> this property of, of uh, whole body uh, regeneration, um, if we kind of map this onto a simplified phylogeny here, um, it's increasingly clear that there are representatives of uh, many different uh, phyla that have this, this ability to regenerate their entire bodies. Um, and so that, as we learn, it'll be interesting to learn more uh, about systems um, uh, such as these ACLs and then uh, from the radiata to try to uh, uh, uncover what could have been ancient um, regenerative programs. Now, as a model system, um, planarians are, are well suited for studying this problem because of their regenerative ability. Um, they have uh, quite a bit of tissue complexity uh, underneath the surface, so they, they look cute. Uh, from uh, looking at them, but as probably many of you would, would uh, know, if you stain these animals to investigate uh, the structure of their bodies, um, you could see quite a complex anatomy uh, composed of tissues of all three germ uh, layers, um, a, quite a complex nervous system, and now uh, thanks to the advent of cell um, uh, atlasing technologies uh, such as drop seek, the complete um, uh, cell content of these animals is now known uh, with candidate uh, factors now um, able to, to give insights into the specifications of these many diverse lineages. So here's, uh, the, uh, the, the animals have quite a few cell types. Um, the, what I'm showing you here is just the, the neural lineage. So it's, uh, again, this is quite a complicated task for them to be able to grow back um, any missing tissue uh, after damage. Now, any um, kind of regener animal regeneration um, will, will, will have to um, involve some kind of production of, of new tissues and a source for cellular material. For planarians, this is an intriguing cell type uh, responsible for this biology called neoblasts. Neoblasts are um, the planarian stem cells that enable this perpetual um, uh, homeostasis and regeneration that they can undergo. Um, they actually um, share uh, many attributes uh, with um, germ bona fide germline stem cells in other organisms, for example, expression of peewee and the use of the pi RNA system. Um, so here is this electron micrograph that I pulled out from uh, one of um, Betty Hayes' uh, papers from the 70s. And where you can see that these, these cells, these neoblasts, uh, have a somewhat large uh, nucleus, scant cytoplasm, and then uh, 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 cytoplasmic bodies called chromatoid bodies that are probably the sites of, of um, interesting regulation that people are still trying to understand. And so um, it really uh, 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 important work that's been done over the last several years has established that these neoblasts are actually pluripotent adult stem cells. Uh, and this was done using single cell uh, transplantations in Peter Radin's lab to take a single neoblast, 
transplant it into a radiated um, host and rescue that animal's ability to regenerate. If the neoblasts are eliminated uh, by, say, gamma radiation, animals fail to regenerate and they ultimately die. So neoblasts have this capability. Planarians actually don't seem to um, it shows signs of aging. So it's interesting to consider, uh, in general, how an animal like this um, can sustain uh, the use of such cells uh, throughout their long adult lives. So the neoblasts are very interesting, um, and, but today I'm gonna focus on uh, kind of another related problem in these animals. Um, when we think about uh, regeneration, what it means to regenerate, I think we all would agree we mean more than um, just the ability to make a collection of differentiated cell types. What we really mean is the complete restoration of form. Um, so let me show you some examples of types of injuries uh, that can result in planarian regeneration. And here we've got some cartoons uh, with uh, different things that we've done to these animals. In a sense, these are all different treatments that can create, we could think of it as different starting points um, on a regeneration pro uh, process. And these fragments will then undergo their own, perhaps uh, seemingly unique trajectories um, as they move their way towards some final one endpoint. So this problem has always fascinated me about, uh, about planarian regeneration, actually about any regeneration. So you can kind of frame this problem similarly in other organisms that, that uh, also accomplish regeneration. In general, uh, there are a lot more ways that a tissue could be injured than any one system could maybe, in some sense, imagine uh, preparing for. And it's also difficult to envision uh, some really complicated system that would involve, say, uh, sensing, continuously sensing the presence uh, or absence of particular cell types. So it's so complicated. Our intuition on this is that there probably are simple rules that help to, um, uh, help to move the animals through these complex landscapes, and what are they? And so um, we've been focusing on, uh, as was mentioned earlier, a particular problem, uh, restoring the head-to-tail body axis. And this is, the, the head-to-tail axis has quite a bit of tissue complexity that needs to be regenerated. Um, there's also sort of complex responses, and it's experimentally sort of easier to um, uh, access than other axes. And so if we take an animal and cut off the head and tail, uh, the response we get is that animals will always regenerate a head at one end and a tail at the other end. And so what really broke open this problem um, several years ago was finding um, uh, phenotypes, uh, basically morphant uh, phenotypes from RNAi. And um, during some uh, early developmental gene screens, when I was a postdoc in, in Peter's lab, we found a beta, that beta-catenin RAI would result in a failure to make a tail, but instead animals uh, would make this head. So somehow beta-catenin was acting to promote tail identity um, at the expense of head identity in normal animals. Um, and then that led to a search to, to find um, signaling ligands um, and receptors, uh, extracellular modifiers that might mediate this decision in normal animals. Uh, and so a search of the nine planarian Wnt genes uh, found that uh, the causative Wnt uh, called, uh, is, is probably Wnt1 because this Wnt1 RNAi results in uh, phenocopying beta-catenin RNAi. And then um, we also looked for inhibitors uh, that might modify this process and found that there's a single a homologue of the secreted inhibitor NOTAM uh, that is now known to deacylate Wnt's. And NOTAM inhibition uh, results in, uh, in some cases, in head regeneration failure or actually regeneration of an ectopic tail. And so this system kind of provided the kernel for um, further investigations. We're still, as was mentioned, still trying to understand how this works. But some first observations were simply to look to see where WINT1 and NOTAM are expressed in these animals. Very tellingly, um, in uninjured animals, uh, WINT1 and NOTAM are expressed at the two termini at the very tip of the, the head and tail, and along the uh, midline. Uh, so when one is expressed in a set of cells at the tip of the tail, notum is expressed at the tip of the head. And if we look at, uh, through regeneration, um, uh, early on, these are, both of these genes are injury-induced. So early on, and, and I should say these are in C2 hybridizations I'm showing here, early on when one is activated at any injury site, including injury sites that make a head, um, but then it's only sustained in expression um, in, uh, at injury sites that are making a tail where it sort of coalesces to the new uh, posterior. We call, we call this the posterior pole. Um, by contrast, NOTAM is expressed uh, selectively at anterior facing wound sites in this, during this early time period. 
Um, and then uh, as regeneration proceeds, it also coalesces into uh, an aggregate of cells uh, at the anterior pole. And so the logic of this system seems to be that um, essentially any injury site will elicit expression of WIMP1. Any injury site might be given the opportunity to sort of undergo some of the signaling. But for some reason, um, nodum expression seems to be selective to sites that face anterior. Uh, and this uh, ultimately uh, will then drive uh, inhibition of WIMP1 uh, which will um, inhibit beta catenin and result in head formation. The nature of this asymmetry is still very intriguing to consider, um, but, uh, but we know a couple properties about it. One of them is uh, that, and this is maybe a little hard to see here with the blue, but we don't need to remove uh, any tissue in order to get this asymmetric response. So here um, we've uh, just sliced the animal instead of removing any tissue. And six hours later, examined for, uh, by in situ hybridization for nodum expression, you can see it, it turns on on one side of the wound site and not the other. So cells are somehow computing, we think, their orientation with respect to the wound site. And this is a very critical early step in planaria regeneration. Now, recent work has also shown that um, this muscle, these uh, nodum positive cells are actually um, expressed within longitudinal muscle. Uh, on the body axis, so it's possible that this longitudinal muscle is actually conveying some asymmetric information, something we're uh, quite interested in. Okay, and, but nonetheless, however this asymmetry works, I think this is telling us something about the system, uh, and, and, th and it's this, that uh, there's, there's a system in place that will trigger nodum expression asymmetrically. It does so uh, uh, at any uh, region on the body axis, and this kind of helps set up a situation um, that would be familiar to you if you've worked with planaria before because if we take this middle fragment here, we know it's going to regenerate a head on, on one end and this other fragment, this tail fragment, will also regenerate a head. So these are fragments that would start off with sort of different AP information states, but nodum expression uh, uh, asymmetry through this um, system, would, we think, will, um, uh, will allow for head regeneration despite that. Okay, so then um, this was work I, I did as a postdoc, and then when I, I started my lab, we got interested in this, of this, this, these Richard determinants for nodum expression. So one of my first graduate students, uh, Constanza Vasquez Dorman, set out to look at this transition between the early and late stages of nodum expression. And what she found is that in animals that are, were irradiated to eliminate all stem cells, um, then this later expression uh, did not happen. And so we thought perhaps uh, this could have been a nonspecific effect of irradiation. Uh, alternatively, there could have been some kind of specialized program that would take neoblasts and turn them into cells of the pole that express nodum. And so to investigate that, she used expression profiling uh, of neoblasts taken from injury sites and found a, a factor, a ZIK1 transcription factor, that here you can see from double fish uh, is expressed near an injury site at this kind of early regeneration time. It's expressed in neoblasts at that time. And as regeneration time proceeds, it ultimately becomes expressed at this anterior pole in nodum positive cells uh, that, are, um, that, are, uh, that are negative for the uh, neoblast markers here. So it's consistent with this, doesn't prove this lineage, but it's consistent with this potential lineage that would relate neoblast injury and uh, the production of these pole cells. So to further the test that she inhibited ZIK1, ZIK1 RNAi uh, very much resembles the radiation uh, treatment for the head uh, in that uh, it doesn't affect the early stage, but it does affect this late stage uh, of expression. Uh, and, then, um, and then if we looked at these animals over time, these animals um, fail to regenerate a head and they actually succeed in, in making a tail. Um, and so we think it's sort of consistent with this model. Then we tried to test it a little bit further and suggest that um, pro if this model is correct, then um, ZIC is responsible for producing nodum. What nodum does is to inhibit beta catenin. Okay, what nodum does should be to inhibit beta catenin. And so then maybe if we inhibited beta catenin at the same time as ZIC or nodum, uh, we would be able to rescue head regeneration. Uh, and that is uh, what we've seen, and so there are other interpretations of this experiment, but uh, we're pursuing the uh, hypothesis that there is some kind of um, uh, differentiation program that will take injury-induced in neoblasts and use them to produce these anterior pole cells. And so we think this is potentially of kind of some, uh, uh, we're, we're still interested in understanding more about this process, 
Um, but, but there might be kind of a bigger picture message here, uh, which is that if we look at these cells at the anterior pole, they also turn out to express a number of other secreted factors that are important for regeneration, like false statin, for example. And so it's kind of a signaling center, um, we think, perhaps an organizing center uh, that's very important for, for head outgrowth. And in fact, transplantation experiments, I'm not showing here, that were done recently, were able to take uh, those um, pole cells, transplant them into flanks of animals, and those were sufficient to get outgrowths. Um, so we think this, this could be a kind of bona fide organizing center. And of course, in um, embryonic development, uh, signaling centers um, such as the one shown here are only arise very, um, uh, very briefly um, and through programmed events. Regenerating animals, at least this regenerating animal, needs to be able to produce an organizing center like this on demand. So that could be an interesting uh, kind of principle to emerge from this work. So I've talked about two injury responses, uh, but we think that there must be more to the story of repatterning and regeneration um, because of kind of thought experiments like this one. Uh, so if we took an animal and uh, cut off uh, its tail at this position versus this position, there are now two kind of divergent sort of separate outcomes uh, that are going to happen. Um, in one case, the animal must make a tail and the middle of its body, its trunk, uh, in the other case, it's only going to make a tail and not a trunk. And so we think that probably there must be some information from uh, existing tissue that's very um, important for regeneration. And one candidate type of molecule that we've been pursuing is uh, factors that are regionally expressed along the body of the animal. So a series of expression profiling and uh, candidate approaches have found a series of genes, uh, term positional control genes, uh, which are expressed regionally. And so here there are too many to see, but there are, there are a lot of them uh, here. And it's, it's known from work in uh, Peter Radin's lab that these are actually expressed in this body wall musculature um, shown here. That might constitute a kind of positional code. And if we do kind of a cross section of this cartoon, uh, what you're looking at is a schematic of these muscle cells, which are uh, mononucleated muscle cells and have cell bodies that kind of um, uh, project into the internal space where neoblasts reside. And so they're in, actually in kind of close proximity to neoblasts. They would potentially have the ability um, to control neoblast fate or activities. So we've been investigating this set of genes as possible candidates for a kind of coordinate system that might drive uh, the respecification of missing tissue. Okay, and so then Rachel Lander, when she was in the lab, uh, 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 was do, did a number of screens and found um, a number of interesting phenotypes that we think are, are indicative of uh, function across the body axis. Uh, here are three that she focused on, and these three uh, a Wnt ligand, PTK7, which is a Wnt co-receptor, and then NDL3, which is uh, likely to be an FGF uh, decoy receptor. Um, these all have uh, uh, apparently what, what seems to be body, expressed in body-wide uh, grade, transcriptional gradients. So we can see this by in situ hybridization. We started to do, try to quantify this at the level of individual cells, uh, and we think that these factors are demarcating domains along the body axis. They're all expressed in these muscle cells. So what are they doing? When Rachel inhibited these uh, factors, she found that um, if you take a look at animals, that these trunk fragments that are generated by amputation and inhibit any one of these genes, the animals made a second trunk. Um, so what you're seeing is the, the pharynx here in this in situ hybridization. And kind of, kind of curiously in this uh, phenotype, um, we only see this phenotype in situations where animals are not ordinarily supposed to be you know, make, making, making trunk tissue. And so it kind of feels like it could be consistent with this idea of factors that are, that are indicating the presence or absence of larger domains of tissue. Um, now, these factors are expressed uh, before injury. They're also expressed during injury. And so in principle, they could act either before or after injury. And so to test those two uh, possibilities, um, we could imagine, that e again, that either, either in blue they're sort of a factor that, whose activity is sort of injury dependent, or in yellow, uh, a factor who's, who has some activity prior to injury. So to test these uh, hypotheses, 
we just inhibited these genes uh, for a long time without injuring the animals. And when Rachel did this, she sees these same phenotypes, extra trunk tissue uh, forming at the expense of tail, uh, even in animals that were not injured at all. And so I think this provides very strong evidence that there are going to be um, very important factors in regeneration that are not necessarily injury-induced. They're part of the tissue um, uh, regionalization program, uh, and then regeneration makes use of them. Genes like this also have very interesting um, behaviors uh, in regeneration. And so if we looked at animals um, who are, which are amputated and begin their new life uh, as these tail fragments that are trying to regenerate a head and a trunk, we could track the expression of these genes over time and see that they um, dynamically reset um, their expression domains. In some cases, they do this, like this Wnt uh, gene they, uh, does this by, by overshooting uh, before it reaches its final um, destination. So we're very interested to understand uh, how it is that these, these genes uh, relate to each other um, during the reestablishment of the axis. So altogether, we think um, there could be a kind of um, positional code uh, that's uh, encoded by these, um, ex these, these regionalization factors, it's possible that they could um, either control neoblast fates or perhaps localization uh, or other activities. And this together is what allows us to make, uh, uh, allows the animals to make differentiated tissues and, re and regenerate. And it's probably the self-regulation of these um, positional genes that ultimately underlies um, the, uh, the regeneration uh, programs. And so one, one way that we've been thinking about testing this hypothesis is to um, modify the, um, the positioning system and then um, examine that, the potential outcomes on uh, organ regeneration and organ um, homeostatic ability. So um, this is then going to be the last bit of um, uh, experiments I'll show you. Um, and we've done, we've done a number of experiments now looking at the eyes uh, because it's a system, uh, the eyes are quite useful. You can poke out the eyes easily and uh, score them easily. They're a simple organ, there aren't too many cell types. And we know that notum itself in uninjured animals um, expressed from the pole up here uh, negatively interacts with another Wnt gene and this controls the position of the eye. So I'm, I'm kind of schematizing, uh, we know where these genes are expressed, but I'm kind of schematizing what, we, what our assumed activities of these genes are um, in terms of placing the eye. So normal animals uh, might look something like this. If we inhibit nodum, uh, this will shift this pattern uh, upward, anterior, and then ultimately then a new set of eyes uh, forms in that location. Uh, okay, so uh, Eric Hill uh, uh, was a graduate student in the lab who, who wondered what would happen if we started to poke out these eyes. How would the animals respond? <laughs> Um, and, of course, normal animals are able to robustly regenerate um, their, their eyes. But if we look at these, um, the animals that underwent the patterning shift, the new eyes uh, that form through the pattern shift, they can regenerate uh, just fine. Um, and that kind of makes sense. But the old eyes can't regenerate at all. Um, so that, that ability um, is lost, or, or in another word, way of saying this is that the location of, re of regeneration uh, has been shifted by this RNAi. So we sort of assumed when we looked at these animals that eventually these old eyes would go away, because like all tissues, uh, planarian eyes undergo robust uh, tissue maintenance, uh, the turnover uh, of tissues um, caused by neoblast activity. So Eric, um, in a kind of a heroic experiment, watched these animals for a very long time. Um, so they, these eyes, these uh, new and old eyes, persisted uh, for extremely long periods of time. He watched them for 200 days, um, and they persisted. Um, and we know that this is actually uh, over three cycles of complete uh, turnover of these eyes. And so I'm not going to show it, but we've done BRDU experiments and um, inhibition of stem cell activities related to eye formation. And we now are quite sure that these, um, these pre-existing eyes uh, from the treatment that cannot regenerate can nonetheless undergo uh, seemingly perfect homeostatic uh, maintenance. The, the system that, that takes progenitors and places them into eyes uh, just doesn't care about this positional system, at least to this level. Um, so I'll, I'll schematize this from a, a cartoon here uh, showing um, that these eye progenitors are actually local, pr produced over a larger range and uh, we think based on other experiments that they're able to home uh, to either uh, regenerative or non-regenerative tissue. And so this is going to be an interesting case study to maybe try to separate uh, regenerate re activities that um, have to do with injury-induced regeneration versus 
uh, homeostatic uh, tissue maintenance. <clears throat> and then in, in some other experiments in, uh, we've been undertaking to, to see whether this is a phenomenon that's restricted to these perturbation experiments or could we see it in the life of a normal uh, worm? Um, and to just kind of summarize those results, we know that there are situations where the animal naturally undergoes patterning shifts uh, when large pieces of tissue are removed and these positional systems uh, need to reset themselves. When this happens, the site of regeneration actually um, uh, moves to a new location uh, and the pre-existing eyes sort of buffer against that. And so um, these, we think, um, this ability to, uh, for progenitors to be acquired by um, existing adult tissues might be a way to kind of integrate new and old tissue uh, during regeneration. So I've told you about um, a couple of, in broad, uh, broad uh, strokes, a couple of, of different principles that I think we're uh, learning from these animals. We're very excited to um, be able to dig into these uh, phenomena further um, in future studies. So I, I, I think I mentioned the people in my lab who uh, did the work. I've been so fortunate to work with uh, amazing students and postdocs, um, and, uh, and, I, and uh, I'm just so grateful uh, to be able to uh, be part of their research lives. <clears throat> uh, and then I also want to thank uh, the funding agencies to, uh, who've been so helpful with the work. Um, this feels like a special occasion I can thank every mentor I've ever had or something. <laughs> uh, so I want to thank Peter and uh, Phil uh, for their incredible mentorship. Um, they, they really kind of helped shape the way that I think about science. Um, and I also want to thank, um, uh, you know, as you go through, you, you realize you, you, that, that you have many, many mentors, not just the official ones, of course, right? So there's other people uh, who I really want to thank who've been so supportive of uh, uh, my, my entry into this field. Uh, Victor Ambrose um, uh, was on my committee and kind of suggested the idea of thinking about planaria regeneration many years ago. Uh, so that was wonderful. Um, uh, and uh, Alejandro uh, sanchez Alvarado and Phil Newmark have been incredible colleagues in the planarian uh, biology field. <clears throat> I also want to thank um, my wonderful colleagues at Northwestern, uh, which has been an incredible place to start a lab. Um, and I'm, I'm very excited about all the developmental biology that's, uh, that's going on there now. Uh, and then I also want to thank um, other uh, trainees that I came up with um, uh, who were, excuse me, former classmates um, and, uh, you know, lab mates. Those people uh, make a big difference in your life. So um, thank you very much. And I was just so delighted to speak with you today. I'm happy to take